Okay, look at this august panel here. Now, secret Republicans, you can come up front. We won't tell. <laughs> it's good Thank to be you. here. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I'm your moderator, Mike Murphy. I'm going to quickly introduce our esteemed panel. Mr. Peter Baker, White House correspondent yeah. for the New York Times, and a whole lot of other cool stuff, including the author of many books, along with uh, Susan, the last two, fantastic biography of Jim Baker, and the latest one, The Divider, about Donald Trump, on sale in the lobby. Susan is a staff writer for The New Yorker and has a long and distinguished career in journalism. Reader, I recommend it. Mr. Tim Miller, old buddy of mine, Republican operative, editor-at-large for the fabulous Bulwark, which you should check out, and author of a fantastic book, Why We Did It, all about what's happened to the Republican Party. And Carl Rove is from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> they also dabbled in presidential politics. You can Google him. <laughs> All right. First question to Tim Miller. Why did we do it? Because I, I look right now as we try to figure out the future of the Republican Party. I feel like an air crash investigator. Is that a chair or a passenger? It's a pretty ugly situation right now. But as a conservative, I never want to be a liberal. So how do we get here will be the first question. We'll throw it to you. Well, I think, boy, we could do the whole 45 minutes on this question. So yeah. I'll try to keep it quick. But, uh, you know, uh, parties are, are really a gathering of individuals. It's a ma makeup of what, the people, of what the people want. And the Republican Party, for a variety of reasons, decided that they wanted to move away that was more nationalist, more illiberal, uh, more focused on the culture war. Uh, I think that there were a lot of underlying reasons for that. Uh, the financial crisis, the Iraq war, every conservative party in the world basically is a nationalist uh, culture war conservative party besides ours. Um, and, uh, and so there's, this has been a little bit of a global trend. And uh, this was happening going all the way back to Carl's days and even before, slowly but surely, the party was moving more and more that direction. In 2012, Mitt Romney eked it out <laughs> against Newt Gingrich and, and Rick Santorum. He was lucky he was one against two if, in, instead of the other way around. And you know, Donald Trump was the Kool-Aid man, came bursting through the door and, and gave the people what they wanted. And uh, I think the bigger question was then, once the party made that change, why a lot of folks, and that's what the book tries to get into, who, who didn't like that change, you know, went along with it anyway. Carl, you're a student of history in a serious manner. Uh, you know the Republican Party very, very well. Do you think we are compounding in the populist course we're on, or do you think there might be a reformation back to what would have been the mean for 20 years in the Reagan? Well, it won't go back to exactly that, but I do think, you know, look, people, people were angry. Republicans were angry after, in 2015 and 2016, and along came the guy who said, I share your anger, and I'm going to throw a brick through the plate glass window. But... When they said, when, when he said, I'm going to make America strong again and criticized Obama on Afghanistan and Iraq, I, I think people looked at it and said, you know what, he, he wants America to have a strong defense. And, and they weren't saying, you know, I want him to withdraw from Afghanistan. We saw this one and we actually did withdraw from Afghanistan. It wasn't just that we did it in a terrible way. It was like, what the hell did we give it up? So he was a, he was a messenger but the message that people were trying to express to him, I don't think is as clear and concise as his populism might be. I think it is like, you know, I want America to be strong. I want America to be, uh, I, I want to get the government out of my hair. Uh, I'm sick and tired of the elites looking down on the middle of the country. And that's not exactly the same. Of, it, it was a way to get, to get them, but it is, isn't exactly what he wanted to do. He was, and I agree with you, he was the, the sharpest edge grievance candidate we've yeah. ever had. We're, you know, the Jack Kemp days of opportunity conservatism are in the freezer for a while. Maybe they're thaw out, I'm hoping. But there's no doubt that he was the grievance lightning bolt of all time. Reminded me a little in a, in a, in a different way of Schwarzenegger, who I work for. People were so mad in California, they thought, great, an action star. He'll blow up the Capitol. Let's try that. <laughs> and that is a very powerful energy. Now, uh, Ronald, I thought, was responsible with it. Trump, I'm a, I've hated Trump since 93 when I worked for Christine Todd Whitman in Jersey, and he was <laughs> sliding around Atlantic City. But that grievance power now kind of dictates the party. Susan, you, you've been an observer, as have you, Peter, but we'll start with Susan, of the Republican Party for a while. How, what do you see as the most significant changes? How do you feel it? What surprised you about this? 
what maybe didn't. What's your take? Well, thank you so much. Uh, I get the privilege of the, the microphone here. So, uh, <laughs> look, it seems... Well, we all look like evangelists here. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to sell some real estate <laughs> courses say, afterwards. I think you're so. selling me something, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'm not buying. Um, the t Trump and the politics of grievance are not something that started in 2016, right? I do think that in Washington, we tend to overstate pretty consistently the role of ideology. And so, you know, I, I was sort of relieved nobody here is really doing that. I mean, you know, Donald Trump wasn't selling an ideology. He was selling himself and he was selling it to a willing audience that had been f fed for, for years an increasing diet of fear, rage, anger, uh, and he ha that happens to be a perfect fit with his personality. Uh, it happened to be a perfect fit uh, with a message that he probably would have used at any point in time uh, when he chose <laughs> to run for president. Uh, you know, so it's the man and the moment, I think. Uh, you know, he, he himself was really an outsider to Republican politics. I think you know, it was his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who said it was a hostile takeover of the GOP that he executed. And you know, in many ways, that's why the theme of our book about it and, 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 and Tim's as well is a story about what Republicans did when this creature, you know, sort of came from outside and took over the party. And it's a story about, to me, you know, an old story about Washington and, and the most powerful drug in Washington, which uh, is, is power uh, and the desire to get it. Now, Trump was very calculated in some ways, and I know that's not a word we usually associate with him, but he certainly came to understand uh, the deals that he needed to make with those who were more ideologically motivated. Uh, and, uh, you know, okay, he's a transactional guy. He was gonna make a transaction and put Mike Pence uh, on the ticket to satisfy evangelicals. He was going to offer them judgeships and you know Supreme Court seats and, and whatever he needed to do. But I do think it's important not to overstate, especially with Donald Trump, the role of ideology. Uh, you know, he wanted power and he happened to be a perfect exemplar of this politics of almost institutionalized, professionalized rage that the Republican Party had turned to in recent years. Peter, I'm uh not going to do a lot of both sidesism here. This is the, you know, the Republican uh, discussion. But I'll make one footnote. Is it just all about grievance politics now? Because I would argue Bernie Sanders is a grievance candidate. Yeah. You know, you want that PhD in aromatherapy candle making, but ooh, you're going to have loans. <laughs> we're we're going to get all the profits from Wall Street and get it for free. Right. You know, it's, it, there's a similar formulation, and we just trapped in grievance politics on both sides now. Well, I mean, obviously, there is a certain populism that you can identify on both sides, right? Susan hates when I use the uh, phrase both sides, by the way, because I almost inevitably say it in a way that gets me in trouble from, well, both sides. But um, <laughs> the truth is, obviously, there has been on the, on the left, you know, an increasing sense of grievance as well against the establishment as, as exemplified by, by Bernie Sanders' success. Having said that, there is, the Democrats have remained a somewhat more pragmatic party, right? Because when it came to the moment when Bernie Sanders actually might have won the nomination in 2020, they kind of recoiled and said, wait a second, no, that's a little too far because we want to win. And we don't think that Bernie Sanders can win as much as we might agree with his, his, his version of, of ideology and, and, and philosophy. So they decided to go with the person they considered to be the safe candidate, which was Joe Biden, uh, who, yes, is probably more liberal than some people expected, but is broadly speaking within the center of the Democratic Party, has been most of his career wherever that center has landed. But I think what's really um, an important thing to, to remember, as Susan points out, this didn't start with Trump. Uh, I go back to Carl when Carl and I knew each other in, when he was in the White House. I mean, we, it, we are in a moment in this country where we are sour about the way things are going, about our establishment, about our country in some ways. No president has had a sustained support of a majority of the public since Bush first term, since W's first term. Starting after his reelect to today, every president, all, all uh, one, two, three of them, right, have had basically under 50% for almost their entire presidency. Now, Obama spiked, obviously, when he first got in. People were excited about him. He had a good spike when o OBL was, was killed. But broadly speaking, he, too, from his second term, spent almost all of it underwater. Uh, Trump never once, not a single day of his presidency, ever had the support of a majority of the population, according to Gallup. And Biden has spent uh, at least the last year and a half under 50% as well. I think we are just 
as a country right now, we are not satisfied with our leadership. We are not satisfied with where we're going. And we are increasingly polarized. why we call our book The Divider. And Trump didn't create this polarization, but he is a master exemplar of it. As Susan said, he is a manifestation of it, and he is an exacerbator. He is somebody who, who uh, uh, is an accelerant, as the firefighters would say. Well, so the question of the moment where you're out of the Republican primaries, is Trump over? Is this the beginning or the end? I would take a bet, and I've been wrong before, uh, I'd bet two to one that he's not going to be the Republican nominee. Am I crazy? Two to one. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I really want to bet 50, 50 so I'll bet a little less. I'll take two to one, I yeah. guess. That's, that's yeah. good odds for me. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll right. take it. How yeah, much look, do we bet? So uh, what? I put Carol it. drives the Vegas line here, so we've yeah. got to see what he says. Well, there was a brilliant column today in the Wall Street Journal on oh. this issue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I did a hell of a job on it, I think. <laughs> but, you know, 31% in uh, December in a USA Today polls of Republicans right. wanted him to run again. Now, 47% said that if he ran, they'd vote for him. Right. But 31%, I want him. Yeah. And he's behind in New Hampshire. Right. In the early polling, and he's behind in Florida. I mean, I do think, that, you know, there is this hold he has on a number of people. But remember, the people who tried to emulate him, you know, uh, J.D. Vance in Ohio wins by seven. Mike DeWine wins by 27. And the rest of the Republican ticket wins by between 22 and 24 points in what used to be a battleground state. Arizona, his person loses the U.S. Senate race, right. and the Asian-American sophomore Republican state representative runs 200,000 votes ahead of him and wins the state treasurer's race. Right. You know, Georgia, you know, our man Brian Kemp, who is opposed in the primary by Trump, right. wins a comfortable victory. Uh, and then we got DeSantis winning by 19 in, in Florida. To me, the bottom of the ticket is even more emblematic. Yeah. We have 85 members of the Texas House of Representatives. We had 84 in 2020. Every single one of them got a higher percentage of the vote in their district than did Donald J. Trump. And, and, and I happen to mention that at Bohemia, and, and George Will said, did it happen anywhere else? I went and checked. Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, Georgia, in virtually every instance, the Republican candidate at the bottom of the ticket for the state legislature, it runs ahead of the guy who's at the top of it. But Carl, you're, you're talking about the general election. Yeah. Mike DeWine would be booed off the stage at, an RN, at, at a national RNC he, convention. He, 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 like, maybe like it, Brian maybe. Kemp is a, a swing state successful governor in, an, in, a nor, in a party that was moving back to what Brian Kemp and what W had done. Uh, Brian Kemp would be a leading candidate right now for, for the presidency. He should be, but he's not. Why? Because he went against Donald Trump. Well, like the people don't want Brian Kemp to run. The, the party regulars, the people that make up the party, don't want the types of people that you're talking about that run ahead of Donald Trump. Yeah. They still want somebody in Trump's image. I don't, I'm not certain I agree with you because Brian Kemp it wins the Republican primary for governor when he is opposed by Trump, who recruits his opponent as a former right. U.S. senator, and he cleans his clock by two to one. Right. So then and why isn't he in the presidential? Why isn't, why well, I think he might be. I, I think February 24th, he's going to yeah. be at a, at a meeting of 500 Texas volunteers in a voter registration effort and donors hosted by the grand cream, top cream of Republican donors in Texas. I, I wonder why he's coming. I, I hope that you're right. Yeah. But I'm, look, I'm watching that 30 And look, Mike DeWine was opposed in the primary by a guy re recruited by and, and, and endorsed by Donald Trump and cleaned his clock as well. Yeah, but look what happened in the same Senate primary in the same state. I mean, J.D. Yeah, Vance yeah, runs as a MAGA. That's a, that's a really good point. Yeah, they all go and, down and to Mar-a-Lago to suck up to and, him. And what, what percentage of the vote did, did J.D. Vance get right, in the primary? Right, way less in the general. Well, but in the primary, it was MAGA against MAGA against MAGA. Like well, see, this Vance is the question, Josh though. Mondell against... I, in the primary voter world, does Trump have a half-life and he's sliding, or does he have a big nut of vote and a plurality that'll do it? Half, half. I, I look at that 38% of Republican voters, and I think, okay, 100% of the dogs know Donald Trump, and they've had the dog food. 38% want to have it again. The other ones are sniffing for something else. Now, can we consolidate? Because we're not winner-take-all. Winner winner take I think the RNC should have gone to proportion. That we're, well, we're, the we're, we're like not, the but it's an open question, I think. We're not, we're yeah. not winner-take-all everywhere. We're in winner-take-all in a limited number of places. Guys, I'm having flashbacks to 2016 here. <laughs> I mean, are you, are you having a little bit of a flashback to 2016 here? Remember how nobody wanted Donald Trump in the Republican Party. Yeah, but we had 17 candidates. And, That's and, right. And, 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 and 
these and two are right. And how many candidates are there going to be this year? I, be, I bet you by the end of the year we're at four or five. And yeah, I, I agree because I think among party leaders and party donors and party activists, there's a growing spirit. We can't make the same mistake again. And so I think there are going to be people who say, I'm hearing it right now. People are saying, you know what? I like you. I'm willing to write the $3,300 check, but I'm going to open my network and my bigger wallet to somebody who shows they can win. And party leaders saying, you know what? The, the chairman in New Hampshire, we're going to be neutral, and I'm open to something new. Sure, but 85%, 90% of the party likes Donald Trump. They might not want him to be the nominee again because they don't, uh, because they don't think he can win. It's a practical question. He's got about 30% of the party that is, that is with him right now. Yeah. We all agree on that. Yeah. Then there's the 60% that these other folks are going to be fighting about the main center of the party, they like Donald Trump. They like MAGA. They like how he changed the party. What they don't like is the fact that he had lost. Like, yeah. and, and they're looking at a practical, may, maybe they will be practical <coughs> like the Democrats were. Then there's a Trump group of 10% that like, is really ready to move on and says, I think we should actually go back to something like Mike DeWine. That, that's a tiny group yeah. within the party. I, I'm not the, the I, I don't disagree with you about the 30%, but I do disagree about how big the sentiment is uh, against Trump. Uh, there are a lot of people that, that I run into that say, and it's, it shows in the polling, I like what he did, but it's time to move on. And there are lots of reasons why they What is there to on. like about what he did? He did try a coup, right? Yeah. I mean, he did yeah. attempt a yeah. coup. Yeah. And that's a concerning statement. Yeah, if they're yeah. like, I like that guy. I thought he did a great job. Yeah. I'm just yeah. He's just wearing on me a little bit. No, no, so, I no, mean, no. he tried the no, coup. No. People don't like the hairstyle. No, 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 no. Look, look, when they say that, what they mean is, he stood up for a strong America. He made America energy he independent. Did? He cut taxes. How did he stand up for a strong America? He yeah. sucked up to Kim Jong Un. He compared us to the Saudis. He sucked hey, up to MBS. Yeah, like, I'm, well, look, did, look. He wanted to break up NATO. Hey, In what hey. way did he stand for a strong yeah. America? No, no, no. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not defending his policy. I'm trying to explain what they see. And what they see is this is a guy who increased defense spending. And when no, he said, Carl, they, they, let they me see this a guy me. that yells at liberals. No, no, and I like no. that. Well, That's what they see. That's go what they go like. ahead and yell at me for a few moments more while I try and make my point. <laughs> so, but but you've got to understand, if you're going to win them back, you've got to understand what's motivating them. And what's motivating them is they said, the guy actually tried to get something done to make America energy independent, and it worked. And he cut our taxes, and he strengthened the military. And when he said a red line, which shocked me, when he said, if that guy does that thing and in Syria and it's going to cross a red line like it did for Obama, I was shocked when he actually then acted. Now, you're absolutely right on the rest of the crap. And don't get me started. Look, you and I have something in common. Both of us, if you go to the New York Times and say Trump insults, we both have a list of the Trump insults. <laughs> Mine is a lot longer than yours, buddy. I took a look at it. So I'm not defending <laughs> the son of a bitch. Okay. Well, we have one thing not in common, though, which is that I supported Joe Biden in 2020 and that you didn't. So there's yeah, that one thing yeah. that was not yeah. in common. But you know what? Well, you know what? Uh, I, did, I didn't vote list. for Donald Trump either. Yay! Hey. All, All right. right. Agreement. Yeah. I, I just, just really uh, quick, I, I just don't agree that the, the people care about those policies that you listed out. There's just no evidence that the Republican base, what they care about is energy independence. And sure, they like that. On balance, if you ask in a poll, do you like that we're energy independence? Yes. But, but was that the motivating factor for what brought them to Donald Trump, what attracts them to Ro Donald no, Trump? No, no, it's Kansas? all dark no. arts and evil, Tim. I mean, yeah. there are two debates here. There's the moral argument about Donald Trump. I think you ought to burn in hell. I've been against him for 20 years. There's the <laughs> mechanical issue. <laughs> Uh, there's going to be a Republican Party. There are going to be millions of Republican primary voters. And the question is, will Trump 2.0 have anywhere near the strength of Trump 16? I'm betting no, but I'm not betting enough because I don't really know. We can. It's the future. So let me, let me turn to team journalism here. And we're, <laughs> we're continuing with this in the Republican know, primaries. The red on red this violence. Is, this <laughs> is like our kitchen conversation in the morning. We're a lot like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you guys think this will be the same Trump with the same surprises? A stronger Trump because he'll be he'll double down. Weaker Trump. I actually think we do somewhat have different points of view on this. Great. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know if we can do a sort of a Carl and Tim thing <laughs> here. You know, um, I just I just I want to say one thing because I do think it's important. Uh, I'm really struck by the fact that the debate that's happening right now among Republicans is fundamentally one of winnability. Uh, and, you know, when they talk about his time has passed, it's not, as Tim pointed out, because he orchestrated a coup to overturn an American election. And I do think that mm -hmm. when we're talking about the future of the Republican Party, it's very hard to see uh, a future for the Republican Party that includes a full and complete repudiation of Donald Trump and that which he stood for and which he took the party 
over the cliff of the Constitution. And let's be real about that. If you, anyone in this room, yeah. if I told you five years ago that you would have sat in your home and watched Americans at the call of the President of the United States storm their own capital uh, in the effort to overturn an election, you wouldn't have believed it, you wouldn't have thought it was American, and you would have thought if one of the two political parties didn't repudiate it, that they were un-American in some fundamental way. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about a narrower question of political tactics, which is, should it be the guy who actually orchestrated that coup, or should it be some of the people who enabled him? And you know, so Nikki Haley is going to run against Donald yeah. Trump. Okay, so did Nikki Haley repudiate Donald Trump? Well, she did, and then she didn't, and then she did again. So I'm confused <laughs> yeah. about that. And I think that's really important yes, if, we're, if we're talking about the future of the Republican Party. Yeah, Susan, two things. One is I think part of the reason that people want to turn the page on Trump is because of January 6th. We had Mike Pence to an event in May of 2021. He walked, and this is Texas Republicans, so we're talking, you know rednecks and he walked into the room and spontaneously 500 people stood up and applauded now it wasn't because he is a stimulating personality <laughs> it's because they wanted one guy could call me up and he said he was a he, he was a big contributor to trump he said i want to come to the conference i want to come for one reason only and that is to tell mike pence thank god for defending the constitution so i do think part of this thing about winnability is people look at trump and say you know what he can't win and doesn't deserve to win but you're asking people a lot to to, to after being falling in love with this guy to suddenly turn around and say that some bitch needs to be hung from the nearest tree so I'm, 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 I'm forbearing my fellow Republicans. I want them to move on for whatever reason. Carl, people get divorced. I mean, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, and, and they are getting divorced. This guy, take a look at the polling of his favorabilities among Republicans, and they began to decline after January 6th. The, and, and with a brief moment up after Mar-a-Lago, after the raid on Mar-a-Lago, which is actually a search on Mar-a-Lago for taking documents he should not have taken, he went up briefly and then he continued back to decline. But the people that criticized him are not viable in the party. Mike Pence might have a couple fans among rich donors in Texas, Carl, but it, he was the vice president. And there's a reason why he's not a viable presidential candidate. Do you know who is the guy that we haven't talked about in the future of the Republican Party panel? Ron DeSantis. He's never criticized Donald Trump at all. He, and now that he's starting to, do you know what his critiques are? Not that he tried a coup, but that the one good thing that Trump did, Operation Warp Speed, was bad, actually. And we're worried that the vaccines that saved a million people might be killing people, and that maybe he wasn't good enough at building the wall. Like, that is the campaign that Ron DeSantis is going to run against Donald Trump, and that's what the voters want. The voters are not looking to the people, the Republican voters are not looking to the people that repudiated Trump, like Mike Pence, you know, like Nikki Haley on and off, like Liz Cheney, <laughs> our friend Liz Cheney. She's at, we did a poll the other day. She's at 1661. Okay, well, that's you know <laughs> that's not really that's not very good. I, you know, you're you won more campaigns than me, but you can tell me if she can come back from that. Nope. So, I, I mean, that's just the reality. That the, the the voters are telling us they do not want to move on from him at all. Maybe they want to move on from him, the person, because well, they think he can lose. But they want to move on to somebody that's as much like him as th they can. Th find. This is the this is the question because if you take the view that Trump is declining and probably won't get nominated, it doesn't mean the cancer of Trumpism isn't still there. And if you want a recent example, let's look at the fascinating 15 ballots for Speaker of the House. Uh, I've never seen anything quite like it. And it's going to be interesting to watch the Congress, you know, zero in on space lasers and the other pressing interests here. <laughs> That, Jew that, Jewish space lasers. Jewish space lasers, friend, exactly, Jewish space lasers. exactly. I, I, the truth is, the, the popcorn bag, I'm kind of waiting for a revolt on the Rules Committee, which is the traffic cop that puts bills on the floor, normally tightly controlled by the leadership, for the Freedom Caucus and mischievous, cynical Democrats to get together and let them have floor votes on the craziest bunch of shit you're ever going to believe in your life. <laughs> Very good for the Democrats to corner Republicans from swing districts. But, Carl, let, let's separate from Trump, any of you, really, the party. Yeah. I mean, the, the House conference is a measure of the party, a weird mixture of, in my view, nuts, and I'm a right-wing conservative, and cowards. 
Yeah. Uh, will that evolve? Will that change? What, what are the whispers you guys hear in your reporting? And then I'll come around to you. No, I think, I think you're right to point that out. Like, Trump will go away. One day or the other, he yeah. will eventually Could be, be meatloaf, yeah. I mean, it's just <laughs> inevitable, right? I don't know if it's 2024. I don't know when it's going to be. Yeah. But Trumpism is the real question, right? Have, has, the, has he remade the party in his image? He, of course, is not about ideology. He's not about remaking a party in a philosophical way. He was not trying to move the party the way Reagan tried to move the Republican Party or Clinton tried to move the Democratic Party. He's just trying to accrue power to himself and then advance whatever th goals he has. The question is what's left in his wake. And I think uh, Tim's point about DeSantis is an important one because what struck me was I think DeSantis represents, if arguably, the future of the party, then what we're seeing is a different kind of uh, version of Trumpism, basically. Trump talked about sending illegal migrants to sanctuary cities. I'm going to send them to those blue areas. Everybody went, oh my gosh, I can't believe he said that. He didn't do it. Who did do it? DeSantis. He did it. He's willing to do some of the things that Trump even himself wasn't willing to do, and he's probably going to be more effective at the way he did it. A 19-point win in Florida is really impressive. Tr Trump never, never got anything like that in a real battleground state. So I think- He never had Charlie Crist. He didn't have Charlie Crist, fair <laughs> enough. He did have Hillary Clinton. No, he's never had a really <laughs> tough race. That's huh? an interesting point. Yeah. I mean, we don't really know. He's the shiny object now because he's not Trump and he plays the cultural right to kind of get over the rope line, but yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Presidential, as you know better than anybody on the planet, uh, it's going through a car wash 800 times and DeSantis is on his third car wash. <laughs> yeah, but, that's right. And uh, I, I don't think he has the same connection to the base that Trump does. I mean, like Trump has whatever else you think of him, an animal connection to the people who really like him. And I don't know that DeSantis has that. I think they, his profile right now is very popular among the Trump right, who is looking for an alternative to Trump, perhaps. But I don't know that he has the same sort of lasting power. Remember jo President John Edwards and President Rand Paul and all the others who were really high up in the, in the polls or in the imagination of the political establishment at this right. stage of a presidential contest. So we don't know who has a, the uh, staying power. One of the things that's interesting to me right now is this question of what is the Republican Party actually for? Uh, and I think that, you know, Trump really muddled that in the sense that when we talk about Trumpism, surviving Trump, we're really talking about a style of politics, right? You know, a sort of a confrontational, in-your-face, culture war, uh, you know, uh, maximize your differences, uh, minimize your commonalities with others. But, you know, I think one of the struggles that Republicans have had electorally in recent years, and, and you know, the record isn't so good in, in terms of the popular vote in presidential elections. We're looking at, you know, seven out of the last eight being one by Democrats, and to me, I'm just, I'm really curious what the answer to that question is uh, among those who, who understand it better than I do, right? You know, I mean, tax cutting, is that, is that enough to, to float an entire party's ideology? Being against stuff, I get, but I'm not sure what Republicans uh, yeah. are for. My view is we're for stopping the things we're against, but Carl, what, what do you think the positive <laughs> agenda is? Pardon me? Positive agenda, You're, you, you write the script for a nominee, Tim Scott, somebody we're not talking about now who turns the wheel. What, what's the forward setting agenda that, that our world would support? Carl's a nonfiction writer. Well, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm stretching here for the good of the country. Uh, what's the pitch? Well, better I, pitch? look, I, th I think the pitch is more traditional republicanism yeah. and conservatism. It is limited government, strong national defense. America has a role in the world. This thing that we, we were talking about, uh, Trump doesn't have an ideology, but he does have episodic moments of what he declares to be his policy. And, and, and for example, his, he got J.D. Vance to endorse him saying, uh, I don't worry about Ukraine, he never started any wars. Well, guess what? That ain't the, that ain't the sentiment in the Republican House or Senate caucuses. They're, they're, they're going to be strongly pro-Ukraine. And so, you know, we're going to have some things where Republicans continue the to House? agree. House is going to be strongly pro Oh, God, yes. Absolutely. Go talk to the chairmen of the Foreign Relations, Intel, and Armed Services House, Committee. Though. The whole House, though, the new guys that have come in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Shit, yes. Go talk to, go talk to Juan Siscomani of Arizona. Go, go talk to these new members, and you'll see that, by and large, they are, yeah, we got a couple of people from Florida that are not exactly solid on it, but I'm, I'm surprised at how strong the conviction is. Because, look, Trump has not worked to change the notion of what it is to be a Republican in a consistent, strong, determined way. 
except for you got to be a bomb thrower and you got to take, take the brick and throw it through the plate glass window. I just have to take the other view again on this one. So I went to the Turning Point USA conference uh, right before uh, <laughs> Christmas, just did a little tourism, wanted to go to Arizona. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Carl, enjoy my time there. I don't know if you would have been very popular there. So uh, luckily I don't have quite no. your, your face yeah, ID yeah, yeah, quite yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can help you with that if you like. Yeah, no, th <laughs> no thanks, no thanks. And the things you just listed, strong defense, cutting taxes, smaller government. I, I spent three days listening to the biggest stars in the party right now, Tucker Carlson, you know, Ted Cruz, Charlie Kirk, you know, all, you know Byron Donalds are there nominating for the speaker. All, I didn't hear any of them say any of those things. Yeah. Like all that they, all they were talking about is COVID, you know, uh, uh, which I guess is small government in some sense, right? But, pr but particularly focused on, mm. on grievances over COVID policies, anti-vaccine stuff, stopping woke. You know, the, the woke indoctrination of the schools, trans people, um, uh, the, the Ukraine war wasn't that popular actually in that crowd. Now that isn't the whole party, right? right? But th that's a big influential portion of the party and, and they weren't talking about that stuff at all. And, and I just, I'm, I think that if, we, if you put up three candidates on, uh, on a primary coming up in 2024 and one of them ran on tax cuts, America's strong, we should be by Ukraine, we should cut government, and, 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 some, and let's say Trump's out, and one person runs on that and the other person runs on the, there's woke indoctrination in the schools and we need to go after the, big, the, the, the corporations that are, you know, have gone too far to the left and that the vac we have concerns about the vaccine. I, I think the second person would win that primary pretty easily, actually. Uh, and here's just a little data point on, on Ukraine, because this is something I'm watching very closely. And I think that, you know, it's been, on the one hand, a remarkable bipartisan success at a, at a moment in time when it is a very divided country. And yet all of the indicators in the Republican side of things are, are trending in the other direction. That Pew Research Center just came out with a very interesting poll last week that says that now 40% of Republicans and Republican-leading independents, 40% of them believe the United States is doing too much to help Ukraine right now. That's up from just 9% in March, right after the beginning of the war. Uh, the faction around uh, uh, the far, I, I don't know if you want to call it the far right or whatever you want to call it, but the, you know, this, this the cluster. The neo-isolationists. Yeah, the neo-isolationists in the House, the same people who stuck up Kevin McCarthy for everything they could get uh, you know, over the, the week to get the speakership, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, uh, you know, who uh, used their uh, influence over McCarthy. Ukraine is one of their major demands. And, you know, it's bluster when she says, well, uh, you know, Ukraine isn't going to get a penny more from a Republican majority in the House of Representatives. But this is not only an increasingly influential block in the House, it is a growing block. It is bigger than it was at the start of the war. And I think it's, it's, it's indicative of where Republican presidential politics is going in this primary year. Why is Donald Trump suddenly started talking about Ukraine all over again? Because he thinks it's going to help him, not hurt him uh, in, in the primary, because it's going to help define what his lane is in a crowded primary. But if that's the presumption, that's what I'm hearing is the Republicans have gone insane. None of the old messages, messaging works. Kirk and Hannity control the party. Um, it's over, right? Biden wins no matter what? Well, no. I, I'm going to no. have a campaign, right? It's done. Oh. No. Or do they win because the country's evil and the right evil Republican can still win? What's still remarkable is if you do the Biden uh, Trump matchups, and again, Carl is better about polling than I, and probably knows the numbers, they're not that far off. Right. The numbers are not that far off. As, as much as Trump seems to be a spent force in some ways, he is still pretty close to even to Biden, who is, of course, himself not very popular. And, that's, and we know, of course, that those polls can't be relied on to be a precise measurement. It, it could be, he could be a couple points higher for all we know. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't think it's a given by any stretch that Biden wins this. Now, he gets to see the union ne address next week. He has an opportunity to present himself as above the, the petty politics of the House Republicans who can't give themselves, you know, come up with a speaker without, you know, immolating themselves. But it's just, that hasn't worked for him. There's the notion of the healer, the, the, the unifier, the old school Paul has an appeal among a lot of people who are tired of Trump, but it just hasn't really brought a lot to him. And we, and we have to look at the elephant on the table when it comes to that election, which is he is 80 years old. 
He will be 82 on election day. He will be 86 at the end of his second term. That's going to be a factor. He himself is a legitimate factor. Right. That's going to be a factor Republicans will use against him, not to say that Trump is a, is a, is a spring chicken by any stretch, but right. that they're going to try to, to make that. A, if That's a weird fight, old and older. Yeah. yeah. Which, again, if a Trump-ish, see, I, as a Trump hater, I'll take a cynic over a crazy guy any time. I won't enjoy it. But at the last minute, the cynic won't do an <laughs> insane thing, mm. which is why I don't hate DeSantis, who I think believes in nothing, you know, a, a, a equal to Trump. I'm, and I, I'm not sure he'll be the nominee either. But isn't, isn't it a worthwhile fight mm. to, to step one, stop Trump? Because mm. if the American politics are so polarized, it's a three-point race with Trump. Seems like kind of an urgent, unifying principle for the party. And I'm kind of with Carl, and we've had our disagreements over 30 years, but... I think a, a, a significant part of the party does have Trump fatigue, and I guess that's the open question. Yeah. You don't believe it. You think it's just kind of a cultural virus in the party, and it's well, not I, going I, away. No, I agree that a significant portion of the party has Donald Trump the man fatigue. Right. But I, I do not think that they ha are fatigued at all with MAGA. Mm -hmm. and, that, that's what, and, and I also dis I disagree. I, I don't want my position to be misrepresented. I actually do think that there's a significant portion of, of the electorate that wants what Carl's talking about. And they're, they're pretty important, the people that want government to be out of your hair a little less and U.S. to play a stronger role in the world, a lot of these more traditional Republican things but don't care as much about the culture war. And they're what we call swing voters now. Uh, and some of them are still Republicans, but some of them weren't. And they were the people that voted for Brian Kemp and, and Raphael Warnock, for and example, in Georgia. Yeah. So and those yeah. people yeah. do really matter in general elections. I just, in a conversation about what's happening within the party, I, I, I think they're a rump group yeah. within the party. I, I, want, I want to go, go quickly back to something uh, Peter was talking about. You, you talked about the strength of Biden as being the conciliator, the unifier, the practical Paul. I think that's what got him elected. And I think his problem today in large part is because he hasn't acted in that way. Mm. And I think swing voters in, in this past election would have said, you know, I'm much more comfortable with a guy who's, I mean, go out and say, look, I, I'm, I'm not going to negotiate on this. I mean, here's a guy who voted against the debt ceiling several times when Republicans were president who now says, you know, it's irresponsible to do so. So uh, I, I agree with you. I think that, that, was a that was a strength that got him there. I, he has not built on it as president. And I think part of his problem in that, and we're talking about Republicans, not Democrats, but part of his problem in that is on the one hand, he wants to be the anti-Trump guy, right? He right. wants to say battle for the soul of our country, as our good friend John Meacham helped him. Right. Uh, frame the uh, contest. At the same time, you want to be a unifier. And, and I get their jujitsu explanation for how these two things are not irreconcilable, but they don't sound like the same thing, right? Either you're a battler for the soul of the country, or you are a unifier, healer after. The problem is we're not past it. So be healing, in a way, sounds maybe premature because we haven't had the battle in order to decide what we are. Yeah, and the battle for the soul of the country was like uh, uh, Georgia's election laws. Jim Crow 2.0, yeah. Yeah. Well, which so turned out to be completely irresponsible and un unsupported by the actual outcome yeah. of the election. So I, I, well, I guess I, I agree that Biden has done some things that, that were unnecessarily divisive, but I also think that he doesn't get enough credit. I mean, we have more bipartisan legislation passed in the last two years than probably any time since when you were back in there in, in the White House. Yeah, so, but, but, I, yeah, you know, but, there, but, but it doesn't, it's not Fox ever talking, it's not on yeah, Fox, and Fox are like, oh, you know, Biden did a great job. They got the infrastructure bill and he brought some Republicans over on gay marriage and uh, the party, everyone's united on Ukraine. We're bringing the NATO alliance yeah. back together. Yeah. And he's done some bipartisan well, stuff. Well, two of those things, two of the, one of the things happened on its own, the Republicans who supported gay marriage. Another one was tradition, was truly bipartisan, Ukraine. Yeah. But take the infrastructure bill and the chips bill. The White House had little to nothing to do with it except sign it. In fact, remember there are points in the summer where the administration is saying, we don't want the infrastructure bill brought up because we think it will undermine Build Back Better. And those happen because of something that we all ought to herald, which is, a, like in the case of China, a freshman Republican senator from Indiana, Todd Young, says, I'm concerned about us being over-reliant upon semiconductors from Taiwan f foundries. And a senior Democrat, Mark Warner, says, you know what, I got the same concern, let's do something about it. 
and the infrastructure bill happens because the nutty Democrats in the House, led by Peter DeFazio, say we're going to re it's, it's our turn to lead on reauthorizing the Highway Trust Fund bill, which has to be done every five years, and we're going to write a bill that says no funds appropriated under the reauthorization of the Highway Trust Fund can be used to expand capacity on any existing federal interstate highway or to create a new mile of interstate highway in America. And the Senate Republicans and Senate Democrats on the Transportation Committee said those people are nuts. It's their turn to take the lead, but we're not going to let them take the lead. We're going to write a bill, and it turns into the infrastructure bill, which $700 billion worth of reauthorization of the Highway Trust Fund from the gas tax and $400 billion worth of new construction. Okay, I, that gonna, doesn't happen because Joe Biden is saying, hey, I got a great in for in, in we're, bipartisan deal. We're almost out of time, and Jamie can give the hand signal for the cold water buckets here in a minute. <laughs> I want to get one more macro point hit on our rem remaining four and a half minutes. Rapid fire. Quickly. Yeah, rapid fire. Here we go. <laughs> Are we missing a big data point? Because look at the governors. Look at the Republican governors. Is, is the congressional and the federal show the only indicator? We've got people, uh, Chris Sununu, we had Larry Hogan, Brian Kemp, who is in some ways the most capable Republican politician in America, in my view, right now. Is the governor story in many ways, a different signal we ought to be looking about, about where the party may evolve. And Tim, I'll start with you. I, I think the governor's races are, ne are, are, are different than federal races. And we see this when you talk to voters, right? At, voters have things that they want from their governors, right? Like there are actual things that they see as impacting their lives. And I, I watched them, one MAGA focus group, it's only 10 people, but just for an example, you know, uh, that was actually in Georgia, and they were bragging about Brian Kemp, but then they were saying that they were upset that their senator and senators and House candidates weren't acting more like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Mike Gates. They thought they were the ones that were getting stuff done in D.C. because they were the ones that they see on TV, et cetera. So I just think that there's a fundamental difference in the nature of a federal race in a governor's race. I think that there's some good green shoots in, in governor's races. I think there are also some concerns. Larry Hogan, you know, get, gets thrown out and they, they put a lunatic in instead of him, right? Uh, you know, you, you would, the most popular governors in the country are, are my people, the cucks, the rhinos, you know, Larry Hogan, Charlie Baker, and yet they've got no purchase within the party. So I, I think that it cuts a little bit both ways. Carol, and then we're going to land on you guys to sum it up. I, I, this will sound odd. Think about the Democrat governors. Yeah. Shapiro sure. in Pennsylvania, Murphy, New Jersey, Cooper, North Carolina. Polis. Polis. Uh, Whitmer. Uh, Newsom. Uh, Pritzker uh, to some extent. Pritzker, maybe. Yeah. Lose, a f lose 100 pounds. Uh, but, uh, you know, they've got talent on that side, too. I mean, governors actually yes. make decisions and deliver results. Yep. And historically, and, gubernatorial uh, candidates tend to yeah. break through in presidential primaries late. Right. Uh, okay. We have two minutes till the fire hoses. So what, what say you? A little more than two. Well, you know, I guess I would just, I would look at what's happening in the states a little bit differently and to say that my fear is actually the opposite, which is rather than, you know, the sort of instincts of centrism and bipartisanship bubbling up, I'm worried about the mess from Washington trickling down. And I, it seems to me that the momentum in our politics over the last few years has been one not only of increasing polarization, but one where we are actually creating new realities around the divisions in the country and, you know, almost making uh, real and manifest and visible, uh, you know, different realities uh, depending on where you live in this country. There's no more, uh, I think, sharp and, and, and better and painful example of that than the kind of post Roe versus Wade world that we're going to be living in for women for whom it really matters, by the way. Uh, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be... You know, if you believe that, that there are certain sets of rights that are, you know, fundamental for women, why should it matter whether you uh, happen to live at the time in Texas or Louisiana or New York or California? Your rights shouldn't be dependent on what state you live in. And I see that a whole new framework, a different framework of laws and rights and responsibilities are uh, being made real uh, depending on where you live in this country. And I'm worried that that is going to solidify the division and the polarization for a whole new generation. So my fear is is much more about the you know the trickling down uh, of the mess that is Washington uh, into state capitals. Yes, Peter, our best export. Um, <laughs> I would in the last minute we have, I would mention two things we didn't mention today, both of which are things we have to think about. One, of course, the X factor is that there are multiple prosecutors with their sights uh, trained on Donald Trump. We don't know where that's going to go. Um, I. 
It'll look good in orange. It, well, it may not end up there, and I'm not sure whether it might help it. You know what I mean? That you can make the argument some people have that actually being prosecuted, at least by maybe one of the state prosecutors, city prosecutor, might actually help him be a martyr with his people and raise his profile in a way he likes. Um, but we don't know what that's going to do to him and that, what that does to Trumpism. Second point is the media. Right, okay, media is a part of all this, right? Conservative media, liberal media, the fragmentation in the media, we all go to our own corners when we want to you know, learn what, that we're right about whatever issue we're talking about. That's a huge factor we haven't thought through or talked about today about how, how that influences the future of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party for that matter. And I think that Trump's mastery of that was unique. All right, well, I'm a semi-neutral moderator. My view is the organizing principle of American politics is to prevent Donald Trump from ever entering the <laughs> Oval Office at any cost. Watch the Bulwark, read the New York, I said, sorry, almost insulted you, the Wall Street Journal, <laughs> or the New York Times and the New, New Yorker. Yorker. Thank you all so much. Thank you.